Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a conversation with my friends. And this week I have with here with us here, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> yes, all every right, you guys. Week. <laughs> every week, almost every week, almost every week. Every week, me and same joke. <laughs> It's like the intro now. It just comes out. Like, I think if I tried to think of another joke, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> exactly. It would just it would just be this. <laughs> yes. All right, you guys. So um, in a technical background sense, I want to let y'all know that I installed a plugin that separates my audio from Landon's in a way that wasn't done before. So if you guys hear anything weird in regards to like how loud she is versus me, like, please type in the chat, let me know so that I can fix it. Um, but otherwise, we're going to have one of our, our media episodes today. So, Landon, what is it that we're talking about today? This is Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix Part 2. What? Boom. We've part never two. done a Part 2 before. <laughs> what is this? We introduced it last week, so probably none of you are surprised. But, <laughs> but, I'm excited. I am too. Because uh, that means we get to talk about the things that we actually want to talk about with, mm -hmm. when it comes to this. Yep. So it was just, there's too much, there's too much starting in this book that, um, that we wanted to get into. So we are in part two and, um, we talked a lot about some of the things that, cause this is the book where things start to bother me. And I really started to fall out of love with Canon and Harry Potter and, uh, rereading it didn't change that <laughs> spoilers if you missed last week. Um, but we're going to really get into this week, some of the things that, um, start to kind of eat away at my joy in regards to canon and where my love of Harry Potter was really all about the fandom at this point. Yes, but first we must say what we say every Harry Potter media stream. Uh, this episode of Enter Stage Window does contain spoilers, not just for the Harry Potter series up to the fifth book, but for the whole god damn thing because it is no longer 20, 2007, which means we can't separate what we know from what we don't. So if you don't want to be spoiled, uh, go watch everything and then come back or suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> I feel like at this point, like in how long Harry Potter has been out, if you care about spoilers, like you can't care that much, you know? <laughs> yeah, like I'm not, I'm not going to be up here spoiling everything, but all of it will be spoiled. No, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, no definitely. I mean, like I said, like you said, we're going to be talking about things that that play to the whole of Harry Potter as a media, even though we're focusing on the themes and topics that are existing within the fifth book. So we will probably stick to the fifth book a little bit, but we'll pull from here, there, and everywhere. Yep. Yep. No stone unturned. There will, things will pop up that really don't have to do directly with the fifth book. So you've been warned. Um, the truth and then, will be revealed. Yes. But that's <laughs> not the only warning we have for our Harry Potter streams. What's the other one, Landon? Oh, there will also be discussion of topics involving the dynamics of past and continual abuse, as well as probably mentioning any anti-LGBTQ rhetoric within the books and also by Joanne herself, because fuck TERFs. Pretty much. <laughs> and that being said, we also recommend that if you would like to support us today, that instead you support um, some of the lovely charities that help out the LGBT community, particularly the trans community. We personally at Interstage Window like the Trevor Project, um, but it doesn't have to be the Trevor Project. If you have, you know, uh, another one like Mermaid Foundation or something like that, that supports trans youth, that's what we recommend. You are, of course, welcome to still do your subscriptions and bits and things if you want to today but what would really make us most happy is if instead you would give some money to the trevor project trans youth lives matter yep and we need help right now um in this country in particular idaho florida and texas they are still battling so um so not a huge amount yeah. has changed since last week um well, florida, so yeah. florida did florida's bill did pass uh mm -hmm. it still has a few more steps to go in before it's an actual law but it did pass its uh the congress i think Mm -hmm. um so uh, any anything or any support towards teachers educators and tra and gay and lgbtq children down in florida uh highly encouraged make your voices loud yeah. and then the positive uh, update is that um i think it was san antonio it was some big city in texas i wish i would google this beforehand but um has created a sanctuary city that says they will you know not expect their teachers yeah. and people that work with kids to report so Yep, there are now sanctuary cities for trans kids. 
I think San Antonio followed uh, Austin's. Yes. Or yeah, Austin's. Um, so there's a couple cities here, there, and everywhere that are popping up with that. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. all right, but let's get into it. We start every episode with talking about our favorite things, and we talked about some favorite things last week. But this book is a 600 over a 600 page book, which means that there are multiple favorite things. So, yes. Karen, <laughs> what is your other favorite thing from this book? All right, so my second favorite thing from this book is the ineffable, magical Luna Lovegood. My gosh, um, when this character debuted in Harry Potter. I fell in love. I literally like hopped onto my favorite Harry Potter role play website and I wanted to play Luna. And if I couldn't play Luna, I was going to play a Ravenclaw OC that was literally like a copycat of Luna and fuck the other person who was playing Luna. I didn't care. I was really young and (laughs) didn't think that was a problem. (laughs) Luna Luna is a fan favorite and remains a fan favorite through time. Uh, And I think she's one of the only truly untouched characters that have like not been so like taken out of canon she's she's pretty true to canon within the fandom uh and that's because jkr wrote her to be weird and actually just wrote her wise (laughs) amazing it's kind of like it's like um all of the problems with luna in canon really boil down to how other characters treat her and not anything that she does or says in the books which is um you know looking back maybe that's part of why I fell in love with her but really to me it was just like I had always thought Ravenclaw house was the coolest house and um and I was kind of remiss that there were not more representation of Ravenclaw characters like even in the movie we have the two twins right and one is Gryffindor and one is Ravenclaw but in the movies they change them to be both Gryffindor so it was like dang it that was like my one come on you guys and then we have Cho Chang and um Yeah, and and she's kind of she's kind of got her own thing, and unfortunately, it never amounts to what it could have been, uh, which we talked about last week. But um, but Luna Lovegood is is who she is at the beginning, and um, and she's great, and the changes that she does go through in this series are just wonderful and magical, and it's just like it's just everything you could possibly want from a character. So I identified hardcore with uh with luna lovegood's version of like an ugly duckling in uh in middle school and high school i also love the uh ivana lynch's story for being casted yes um as far as i don't know if anyone here has heard it but if you haven't let me let me re-say it uh ivana lynch was a huge fan of harry potter and she wrote to jk rowling um explaining like her history and her how much harry potter means to her and basically that she had been suffering from an eating disorder and um, that she found the space in Harry Potter and uh, J.K. Rowling basically came back and invited her to audition for Luna Lovegood and she got the part. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and and I think played it master, masterfully. Uh, didn't, didn't try to change her for anything else than who she was, which is the oddball, believable, kind soul. She's great. I love her. She's fantastic. And she only gets better in later books, but this in this book she's particularly fab fabulous. And, and she's um amazing in fan fiction. Oh Just my god, yes. Fan fiction. Like I don't necessarily read any like Luna specific fan fiction. Uh, although I do have some Luna specific ships. And man, man, oh man, she's fantastic in most fan fictions that mm-hmm. I that I read. Luna Neville. I was so into that and I'm so mad that that wasn't canon because most of the other ships that were very obvious is what ended up happening in canon, but not that one, even though it should have. And here's the deal. Love Lily. Love, love uh, uh, Luna and Neville. However, I'm going to raise you uh, Luna and Neville and throw in a polyamorous triad of Ginny, Luna and Neville. Oh, okay. Okay. The true, the superior ship, to be completely honest. <laughs> the better golden trio, where the their better. inner monologue isn't about how much they hate everyone around them. I do believe the fandom calls them the, the bronze trio. Yeah, but the yes, bronze trio. that too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yes, that w- that's my favorite thing. I love Luna, Luna Stan, okay. Luna Forever. I love book version of Luna. I love movie version of Luna. I love fandom version of Luna. Give me all the Luna, and I am happy. Lovely day. <laughs> so that's my favorite thing from um for this episode. Landon, what is your favorite thing? 
Oh, I mean, you know me. I like something a little dark, a little twisted, a little morbid, you could say. Uh, and I think the horses that you can only see after death just is so beautiful. And it's so inspiring that it, and it's one of the creatures that is actually truly like original to JKR um and that and the Harry Potter world it's based off of other things in mythology of course but but this is like how she turned it and actually what she made it into is original that it was so inspiring that I want it to be like not just a Harry Potter specific thing I want it to be like a thing in mythology (laughs) and just like how cool it is that there are these horses that are like represented representative of the bringer of death so that you can only see them after they die or after you watch someone die and but they really are just peaceful kind caring creatures who live in like families but are like supposedly looking grotesque and it just is beautiful I love it so much I love it too I really like it's this so too. good because when you look uh, at them all together it kind of like it reinforces this theme of like death is not necessarily a bad thing and we shouldn't be chasing immortality yeah. death is actually peaceful and natural and um and the thestrals are like a really good window into that theme there's like i do you know that meme of like the head exploded and like the thinking process head exploded yeah yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. and it's like okay there's horses (laughs) and then there's like pegasuses and then there's like unicorns and the last one is like thestrals (laughs) and they're just so much cooler (laughs) than any other mythical horse that ever existed i mean i love unicorns Uh, so i don't i don't know if i can say that but i do think within the context of the the story thestrals are the cooler unicorn (laughs) well well, in within the context of of the wizarding world and, and in harry potter thestrals is one of the the things that is in the later books that is actually really good and i really love and is masterfully written and masterfully created my my only the only issue that i ever had with it is that like it's so it's so last minute written into the books because it's very obvious that Harry has witnessed death before. Like he he has memories, whether he can visually see them or not, but they're important core memories of his mother screaming as she dies. So like, even though he was a baby, there is textual evidence that Harry remembers watching Lily die. Uh, and then also he killed Quarrel in the first book and still didn't see Thestrals after that. So it's like very obvious that JKR is like, I need a way to get them to the ministry that isn't just brooms. How do I do that? Uh, And then had to like rewrite it and make it work and came up with a cool concept, but also one that doesn't really fit. It fits. It's like a shoved in book in a two full book case. But see, these are the plot hole type of things that don't bother me. You know, because she never goes back and like readdresses why the Thestrals are a massive plot hole. But like when it comes to time turners, she has to have Neville knock over the shelf of literally all the time turners in the world. So it's just kind of like this is one of the the good examples of where like she never addresses that it's a plot hole. And that makes me not give a fuck. And that's great. More of this. Uh, And see, I I don't like this as much because I think it could have been I think if it had gone one step further for a better explanation um like that it you take part in somebody's death or something like that that would have been and I mean maybe that wouldn't have fixed quarrel but I think that would there would have been slightly like that one step further would have not bothered me as much because this is one of the ones that have always bothered me but I love it so much and I don't care best roles are really cool I agree best roles are so badass (laughs) (laughs) all right shall we get into the thick of things yep let's jump into it well, next we're going to do our uh, our summary. No, we're not going to do our summary because this is a part two. <laughs> so we're going to just jump right into the things that uh, make us, we're going to start with the things that make us kind of fall out of love with this book series going forward because we had our pinnacle climactic moment in the fourth book. And, uh, and as we said back then, JKR's writing does not get any better. It slowly proceeds to get worse. Uh, and so this is this is the moment. So let's talk about it. Why why does Harry start to lose his magic? Yeah. So I definitely have a lot to say on some of the things here because these are ideas that 
I felt when I was reading it as a kid, but I wasn't able to fully articulate until many years later because I just simply didn't have the awareness of like story craft and like and what makes a good book versus a not good book. And I just didn't have as much political knowledge as I have now and various things like that. So what we want to talk about first in regards to this is the grief and the anger that's coming from Harry. So Harry is incredibly angry as a as a character and I think that for a young boy who's been through all of the things that he's been through that is perfectly natural and I and I feel like as a child when I was reading these books that I might have said like oh Harry's too angry and that's what bothers me and and that's not true that's not even what was bothering me then and it's definitely not what's bothering me now I actually think that Harry's anger is a good thing however the way he expresses it is not in any sort of clever way. And I think there's an argument to be made about whether the way he expresses it is like natural and realistic for his age, but I'm just gonna be like, come out here and say it, I don't care. I don't care whether it's it's realistic because we're ta- it's a story and I want, you know, to have something to think about. And because basically what happens with his anger is he just kind of like throws things around the room and then is like, okay, whatever, I, I, I commit, I'm going to be the soldier now. Um, it beca- It's very frustrating to read because the anger never goes anywhere productive that could be interesting or could say something. Yeah, I think, and, and when we were planning this out, I spoke to this point too of um, we're on part two of this series. And this is the first time we are talking about Harry's role within the book. And the book is named after him. Mm -hmm. And I know we thought thought talking about him didn't fit into the first episode. It it didn't. (laughs) And it's because the reality is, is that Harry doesn't do anything in this. Mm -hmm. His grief and anger exist, but there's no, there's no arc to it. Well, there is an arc, but the arc happens in the last 50 pages of a 600 page novel um and and that arc is that he gets he gets angry and it doesn't go anywhere he gets angry and it doesn't go anywhere and it's not even like his anger builds on each other it literally is that he gets angry and then someone makes him realize that he shouldn't be angry or he's suddenly not angry or it just dissipates uh and and like that and that to me, like, I equate that to not realistic. And I know that you're saying that you don't need realism, but I, I do because the reality is that's not how anger works. And that's what makes it frustrating. Like yeah. it, anger goes somewhere. Anger doesn't just come and then disappear. It builds and it goes somewhere. And that's like basically the same thing that you're saying as mm-hmm. that nothing ever happens with it in this book. Yeah, because he doesn't, he kind of reconciles it in the sense of he just says, well, I was wrong and I shouldn't have been angry. That's kind of what it feels like he's accepting, which is not true. Harry has yeah. every reason to feel angry. Remember, this is the book, we talked about the abuse last time. This is the book where Dumbledore ignores him for the entire book. He has every right to be angry that no one pulled him aside until the very end and explained to him why Dumbledore was doing this. Like, he has a he's- right. I think that the the first time that we see this is like this idea of it just being it just disappearing is that like we see Harry being forced to go to back to an abusive family where he is then attacked he is then expelled from school his friends are barely writing to him they, he is asking for help and they are telling him he has to wait he's actively asking please come and get me and they're saying we have to wait we can't tell you anything things are happening but we can't tell you anything and he's getting angrier and angrier and he finally gets rescued he's finally there he's angry at ron and hermione who by the way have been the ones sitting there and saying like we can't tell you anything because under understandably it makes sense for that their characters but then he gets angry and suddenly people are like you're kind of being a dick and then he stops being a dick it's like no that's not how that happens <laughs> and it kind of he like he has every right to be angry he does at the people that he's angry at 
Yeah. Yep. No, he has every right. And nobody, nobody really acknowledges that. Nobody really acknowledges that. And I think it's so frustrating and it really just reinforces on Like, this is where I honestly believe this comes from. I honestly believe this comes from JK Rowling's political views. So in the UK, um, they kind of had a very similar situation to what we had in the U S of, um, you know, in the U.S., Ronald Reagan came in and uh, and put in his economic policies and basically pushed everything, like, if you think about the left versus the right, like on a spectrum, pushed everything more right. And then the Democrats, because they're kind of like the central centrist liberal party, um, we don't really have much of a left in this country at this point. But they kind of, and this is very typical, this is just kind of how these things work. When the, the right party goes more right, the center party scoots more right too. This is just a phenomenon that happens in liberal democracies, okay? Um, which I don't have time to go into, but just you're just, so just going to have to trust me. Um, but basically the same thing happened in, in the UK. Margaret Thatcher came in and put forth her economic policies and pushed the UK politics more to the right. And the Labour Party, which is their, you know, more liberal party, basically said, okay, we're not going to fight you. You're right. The status quo is correct. And all we're going to do is try to like not push things more right. We're never, we're not going to push things left at all anymore. You're, you win. Um, and JK Rowling is basically, this is her political view. She, she supports the, the labor party for the most part in the UK, but she supports them in the new labor sense of like the status quo is correct. All we should be doing is dragging things back from the right. We shouldn't try to push more left. So what this means is in the UK, just like what's happened in the US, when the more right party goes right, they, they end up kind of like dragging that centrist party farther with them. And then no, no progress ever gets made. So it's kind of like this, I, well, we're not conservative, but we're not going to do anything for, for progressive politics either. Right. And so it basically the politics become what we are doing right now is correct. The future is scary and, and we don't need to progress. Things are fine right now. Um, and uh, but conservatives are wrong. We can still attack those guys. So, you know, it's OK to beat up Nazis, but like we can't free our slaves because we've had them for a long time. Right. So you see this in Harry Potter where he's he gets really upset. And instead of having thoughts like, gosh, the world shouldn't be this way. Like, here's what I would do if I ran the world, which I think is a very natural thought for like an angry teenager to have, you know, to get a big head and think like, what if I ran the world? But Harry never, ever does this. He just, his just, his friends just talk him down and he goes back to like, everything's fine, you guys. Everything's fine. And not only does he never do this, it is specifically rewarded that he's not like that in later books. Yep. Like when Dumbledore is is talking about Harry and how Dumbledore has the selfishness and need for power and how he's always seized power at his at the best opportune moment and how he appreciates in Harry that Harry doesn't have that drive. That's referring to this time. Mm -hmm. It's referring to the fact that Harry never once thinks I could be in charge or what would I do in order to change how everything is happening? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. He just thinks the status quo is fine. And I, and I believe he thinks this because that's what, that's what Rowling ultimately yeah. thinks. And there's three points and it didn't have to be this way, by the way, there are opportunities inside the books where Harry could have channeled his anger into these types of thoughts where he actually stood for something. And he actually became a character that wasn't super passive and therefore super frustrating to read about in this book. So I'm going to give you my, my three times that I think Harry could have had, you know, um, a political identity instead of being a boring, passive person that thought the status quo was exactly what it should be. Um, Luna, my favorite thing in this book, my freaking God, Harry and his friends are so mean and dismissive of poor Luna. And all she ever does is hang out and chill and want to help them. Like she never does anything negative to them. She just exists as her own weird ass self. And then, and Harry and Hermione and to a lesser extent, Ron, but still kind of Ron are just very like mean girl bullies to her. 
And it's like, why the fuck does Luna even want to help them in the end? I don't know, because they're like, it's literally, and this is one of the places where I actually think the movie is a little bit better than the books, because, um, you know, you don't have to hear about Harry's awful mean thoughts about Luna. And you don't have the conversations that Harry and Hermione have about the people they don't like and how like freaking mean girl these characters are. So there's one point. So what we could have had is Harry going, huh, you know, here's this Luna person who, you know, is very different and everyone treats her poorly. And it's not like she's been abused or anything. She's just, she's just weird. And like, you know, why does our society allow this to happen? Why can't weirdos just exist? He has, he has none of these, none of these thoughts. He doesn't, he doesn't actually um, do anything to try to relate to Luna at all, even though they should be able to relate to each other, but they don't. So that's, all. that's number one. Landon, I'll pause here if you have any comments on that before I move to idea number two. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add in here that like recognizing that the, the arc of this character and the purpose of this character is to keep him in a place in which he will eventually be known for his self-sacrificing. So this is all still possible, like him speaking up and, and being active in his position it's still possible, like what we're saying is still that he's able to still be on that path of being someone who will eventually not find as much worth in his life that he's willing to give it up. Uh, he can still do that and do these things. Mm-hmm. So just just clarifying that, like, yes, we understand that he has to be self-sacrificing and that he that it will never be. It, it doesn't make sense for Harry to also be the person who thinks about seizing power and being the person who's willing to walk into into the uh forest and kill himself yeah but uh, or i guess have himself die. so right. but but he can do this mm-hmm. and still be that person yeah like all of these things that i'm talking about that would like fix it for me and make this book not such a slog and so annoying for me that doesn't change that i understand that the story is about him sacrificing himself at the end and i and i think that you could have had a character whose anger ultimately turned into this very deep and pure empathy to where he still felt like no, I should sacrifice myself because I'm just one small part of this giant world. Like he could have still felt that way and you still would have ended up with the same ending. All right. Yes. So but I think I would have taken a more emotionally yeah. mature uh, mature story arc than JKR could have written. Anyway, I think so. <laughs> uh, continuing with the other two examples. Yeah, so the second example of where I think we could have had this is in Trelawney's Firing. And this is another part where I think the movies are way fucking better than the books. When Trelawney is fired in the movies, like Hermione, um, like Emma Watson has this look on her face that is just like heartbreaking. Like she recognizes the absolute injustice of this and how like awful it is to fire Trelawney. Like this woman, Trelawney did not do anything wrong. She did not deserve to be let go And then kicked out of what is basically her home. There was no reason to do any of that. But in the books, instead of like this being a heartbreaking thing where all the characters are like, oh shit, like this is a deep injustice on the way that the school is functioning this year. They're like, fuck that bitch. She was crazy anyway. Bye bye. Like literally, that's really what they do. Harry doesn't care. Hermione doesn't care. Ron doesn't care. Hermione's even kind of happy. She's even kind of happy because she's still bitter that there's one class at Hogwarts that she's not good at. <laughs> and it's yep. ridiculous. But but instead of having the characters have thoughts that's like, this is a deep injustice. They're just like, well, she's crazy anyway and divination's stupid, so bye bye Awful. Yep. Awful. No, but it's... again, I think it's how J.K. Rowling actually feels. Yeah, and I think I I think again it goes to show that idea of um, man, it she is not capable of of understanding that depth of of grief. I feel yeah. like it's like it, it feels like fake grief, right? Like she she has experienced grief she's experienced trauma but there is a level of like grief that she's not connecting to with these characters and you see it because you see them all lack this level of empathy especially with Trelawney's case Mm -hmm. like the fact that nobody feels like even then McGonagall doesn't do it to stop like the public embarrassment of this woman but does it in order to like fucking it's like (laughs) she doesn't want up umbrage 
Yeah, she does it to one of Umbridge, and also, like, because it's the morally right thing to do, not because there's any emotion in there. Yeah. Yep. Because there's not. Because there's not. All right. Idea number three on where Harry could have potentially had these thoughts and channeled his anger into something and not been so passive in this book. Um, Ferenzi talks about... No, we can we can do that click. It's okay, because we're All talking right. about the MC passivity. Um, Ferenzi talks about divination he talks and he actually explains it in this book in a way that we have not experienced before where he talks about like divination is not a science it's not something that you can really even teach in a classroom it's more of an artistic pursuit and the closer that you get to the um the truth of divination, the more you realize you don't actually understand the machinations of the universe. And Frenzy has this beautiful speech where he explains it after, you know, Trelawney is fired. So this is another opportunity where Harry could have a thought that's like, huh, you know, I never really thought about the world being structured that way. Here's another way to think about how the world is set up and the way that we all function inside of this world. But he does not have any thoughts like that. It's literally just like this this passage and it's it's beautiful and then it just it just disappears. It's almost like this setup that never gets paid off in the books because we never come back around to this idea of divination being this very esoteric sort of thing that's not really um something that that is a science. If in fact I would say even kind of the opposite happens or we get more like um, wizarding world mechanics of how various divination stuff works. We don't get more into what Frenzy is saying, even though what Frenzy is saying is far more interesting and complex. But we don't. Nope. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's, I think that it, she, it's almost like I compare it to like fake books on a bookshelf. Like where someone wants to look like they're well read or whatever. And so they have a bunch of books on their bookshelves, but then you go and they realize they're like plastic or they're those, those ones that are painted where it's like, she fills that in, in her world so much with these like fake little things where it's like, oh, this is really interesting, but there's no depth there. Yeah. And you never really learn anything. Uh, and, and this book in particular is filled with that stuff. Yeah. Filled with world building um, setups with no payoffs. With no payoff. And it's just like, and that's fine. Not everything needs to be, like, when you're creating a world, especially if you're never going to explore it, you don't need to Tolkien like it, right? You don't need to develop a language for it if you're never going to speak that language. But I do think, like, being able to then connect it and actually make it make sense within the book that you're writing might be important. <laughs> and having Harry yeah. have a connection to it would have been that opportunity. Yep. But instead, what we have is we have just complete main character passivity. This book is the, the biggest oh, example God. of that. Everything happens to Harry. He doesn't yeah. do anything. And and I understand that if there was a point of, like, grief that was being mm. point. Like, if it was a, if there was purposeful character development or narrative voice being done to prove a point to go through the stages of grief that he goes through in this book um but it's not because it de it never changes he never he never gets out of where he's at and he remains passive through the whole the whole book there are two times in which he is not passive and that's when he challenges on bridge about being a liar and defends and defends dumbledore and where he goes after Sirius. Those are the only two times that he is not passive. Oh, and in the, in the very, very end, when he destroys Dumbledore's office. Mm -hmm. Those are the three times that he is not passive in this novel. And it's a 600-page book. <laughs> like, it's even written in passive voice. Yeah, a it's, lot of it is. A lot of it is. It's a incredibly, and it's something that we haven't seen. This book is not about Harry Potter. This book is about the world. But again, the world is full of fake books on a bookshelf. Yeah. Like, that's the thing. And it makes it an incredibly difficult book to read. Um, it could have been cut by a lot. 
<laughs> and I just uh, and I just think like I just think like at this point. So we talked about in the the third and the fourth book how like she started getting popular, and so editors started caring, and it, it turned into these these really good books. Well, I think she got so popular. This is my pet theory. I don't really know, obviously. I think she got so popular at this point that she was able to say, "Fuck you, editors. I do what I want." And this book is purely exactly um, what she wanted to write uh, with with no cuts and very little guidance. And so everything in it, it just makes me question, like, why is Harry our protagonist? Why is he our point of view character? Because when you're crafting a story and you're choosing what how you want to write it, you know, if you want to have a point of view character that's kind of got this um, sort of a, like a passive omnipotence, but not really, like we only have access to Harry's thoughts. And every once in a while, we'll have a scene that's from some other character's point of view, usually Voldemort's, but but for the most part, And even then, we're Harry's. getting Harry's comment. I mean, it's, it's yeah. omniscient, it's omniscient um, third person. So yes, it, exactly. He, he we are seeing it through Harry's point of view while being an outsider of Harry's mind. Yeah. So, we're not so to when you have most. Yeah, so when you have that whoever whatever character it is that you're going to choose to be that perspective is a very deliberate choice or it should be. And I just feel like in Harry Potter by the time we get to this book, JK Rowling has forgotten why she chose Harry to be her protagonist. Because I read these and I just yeah. think like, and this, this continues to happen. Like I still have these feelings about the sixth and seventh books too. Like I, I just start to question like, okay, so wait, why wasn't it Neville? Cause you're not presenting any sort of reason to me why Harry needs to be the protagonist. The sixth and seventh one is better for me. Um, but I also think that her, Harry's passivity speaks to a, yeah, I think forgetting who, who Harry is and why, but also that she struggled with this book the most. Oh yeah, you can tell. Uh, I think it's very obvious when you are reading the whole series that y- even if you didn't know about the Long Summer, you could you could pick out the book that she struggled writing the most, and it is obviously this book. Yes, because and that's and that's taken because it's not Harry's point of view. Um, there was no, and there was no reason for it. Like, even though it was third person omniscient, like Harry was passive in his own story. Uh, things just happened. Mm -hmm. They happened in a series of events. They were smart things to happen. I think they were things that were necessary to the book. However, if there had just been a little, like Harry character development wise or emotional development wise, I, I think that if there had been a little bit more then it would have been it would have not been as obvious that she struggled with this book but because she kept harry so incredibly passive within his own novel and a story that's named after him uh and a a story that we're watching through his eyes sort of it's terrible (laughs) it is true so so just if you haven't read it in a while um we have we had our summary last week but i just want to point out some instances where um, he's incredibly passive. If you think about the whole like defense against the dark arts class they have, who does all the work for that? Hermione. All Harry does is show up and throw up. That's what we call it in the teaching world when you have a subject matter expert come in to teach a class that doesn't really know how to teach. Um, and you set up everything for them. You do all the hard work for them. You give them a lesson plan, whatever. You know, you you make a list so that if someone tells them about the secret club, they, they break out. Uh, you do all that stuff for them. That's what Hermione does. And then Harry comes in as the subject matter expert and he shows up and throws up, right? That's what he does. Um, another great example is the... The uh, this these words aquamancy and legulum legulumancy Legi- legilimancy the aquamancy and legilimancy lessons um he's having those and he's and he's kind of he's kind of trying not really um because it's it's Snape and he doesn't want to and then um, I, and and I think he's also in cape I mean, we'll get to that but yeah yeah and love. but then <laughs> but the point for for this section is that Snape cuts him off from the lessons and Harry's like well fine fuck it bye he doesn't tell anyone yeah. he doesn't fight for it he doesn't ask why he doesn't even like he doesn't do I mean, anything about it i think i i don't think he needs to ask why i think he knows why uh and this he he done fuck up he did cross a boundary but uh <laughs> I, he never does anything else with that no he doesn't and do it, anything it, about that and it disappears like it mm-hmm. never like it's not even this you can't even blame it on the excuse of harry doesn't want to deal with it and therefore doesn't want to and therefore isn't bringing it up because 
when people don't want to deal with things, they still think about things. And since we're privy to Harry's mind, we know that he's not even fucking thinking about it. Yep. Yep. Like, there's never in the back of his mind, maybe I should have done Auckland and Seymour. Like, that would have been even more powerful if it once or twice between when Snape tells him to get out and when he realizes that he, his mind was infiltrated and that he ended up resulting in, in Sirius's death because he didn't get occlumency the way that he should have if he had thought about it twice within that time about maybe I should talk to someone about doing occlumency or man I really need to tell them about the fact that I'm not doing occlumency anymore just even a passing thought yeah it would have been 10,000 times more impactful and would have actually shown like where Harry was emotionally rather than what he uh, rather than what what JKR is hoping we assume yeah Yep, yep. Just a quick little moment of regret of like, oh, dang, I shouldn't have done that. Would have, yeah, would have helped. Just, or just being like, fuck. Hermi- yeah. Or being like, yeah, I know, I'm tired of Hermione bothering me about this, but maybe she's right. Maybe something is dangerous. Because you know what? He has this terrible, like, th- and that's a whole, you know, we're going to get that into that in a second. So never mind. But yeah, he's just so incredibly passive in his own book that it, it fucking sucks. It sucks. <laughs> It's very annoying. So, it is very, very annoying. It's incredibly annoying. Um, so yeah, and, we went from the technically why, the, the technically best book to the technically worst book. And what we've got on yes. this slide here is basically why it is, in yes. my opinion, in a technical sense, the worst book. And you can tell that she struggled with coming up to for dates. She struggled with coming up for um, like dates or, or, uh, or, or like w- what I mean is like deadlines is that mm-hmm. she struggled with this book and you can tell with how lazy it's written. Yep. All right. Shall we move on to the privacy of the mind? Yes. So a huge theme in the Harry Potter series and especially in this book is the idea of the privacy of the mind or the lack thereof. So we would just like to talk a little bit about some of the ways that that comes into play in the Harry Potter series. So the first time that you see it is the concept of possession, right? So in the second book, Ginny gets possessed by uh, by that diary, right? And um, by Tom Riddle, essentially we find out that it's it was Voldemort all along, wow. Um, but Harry in this book, becomes possessed in a sense by Voldemort and um and and Voldemort is kind of using his connection to Harry that neither of them fully understand at this point to get Harry to do things that will help Voldemort reach his goals and it's really interesting that this is going to be more complaining I can feel it's going to be more complaining (laughs) um It's interesting that the concept of possession was introduced so early, and Mm -hmm. yet we really don't have very many examples of it except coming from Voldemort. So possession is clearly something that evil, quote unquote, people do. And um, I am remiss that this concept is not further explored even in like maybe some background stuff or like the history of the wizarding world or anything like that. It's kind of just set up as like, here's an evil thing Voldemort does sometimes. And then, and that's kind of it. Well, it's supposed to, I, it's supposed to tie together with the representation of his, of, of consuming or being integrated with his soul. Yeah. Right. So it's, it, it, which yes, there is an opportunity to talk about it as far as like, when with horcruxes anyway we'll talk about other problems with horcruxes next next book but <laughs> yes. uh, there there is an opportunity there but if we look at the possession earlier Ginny was being possessed because the part that existed in Voldemort's soul in the book of Tom Riddle's diary was slowly taking her over and was able to exist outside of the diary because it was basically for lack of a better word downloading itself into Ginny's consciousness the more that Ginny put into the diary the more she took away of Tom Riddle uh and then as Voldemort returns we are starting to get the baby hints that Harry has a piece of soul of Tom Riddle slash Voldemort already downloaded into (laughs) his mind plug into the Harry Potter matrix (laughs) honestly yeah Uh, so it's this idea of if you are attached by the soul 
then there is a connection there that allows you to interface with the other parts of the whole, right? However, it is so lazily done, that idea, and never used again, really, truly, like, faced again when Harry's hunting down Horcruxes, and there is an opportunity for Harry to be really good at sensing where the fuck Horcruxes are, because he he already has that connection with the other parts of Voldemort's soul, that he that, that it, it that it never completes that cycle or that idea it's yeah. another hollow book on the bookshelf why isn't harry potter or why isn't harry himself a horcrux dowsing rod for voldemort's horcruxes why isn't he, he? i don't understand or or like or like oh my god and also like he can f- so there's in the seventh book he talks about being able to feel the soul inside of the ring mm-hmm. and it having a and having a um, power over him he but it's Ron that seems to be affected most by mm-hmm. the situation and that should not be the case no one else should be able to feel it it can it in that book no one else should have been able to feel it it could have affected if someone wore it a long time but it absolutely should have affected Harry Potter the absolute most Mm -hmm. given the fact that there was already a downloaded piece of soul inside of him and that he has the connections of being able to feel it and he should have been able to have any sort of connection with with any of his parts of his soul and it was a half written idea that never fully got developed and it makes me so angry (laughs) because it could have been really cool about possession it's the plot hole of horcruxes that's what we're dealing with in this particular case yeah and it's it's just it's it's really sad because it's it's a really cool idea of the way that souls connect and interconnect with each other in the universe and then it just doesn't really it doesn't really come to fruition you know it doesn't really come to fruition and the little bit that we learn about Horcruxes, I'm see, I'm going to go on this rant. Uh, <laughs> I will, I will hold back. But the little we learn about is the idea that cutting, that you're cutting off a piece of your soul. But that seems to be untrue by everything that we're seeing with Harry and his connection to Voldemort. And like, okay, if this was further the developed, then we could further develop that occlumency and legitimacy wouldn't work. Like, not that Harry sucked at it, but it wouldn't work because he, they're literally connected by soul pieces rather than a mind actually needing to be protected and weakened. Yes. Oh, my God. And the, these are examples of why um, from this book forward, I was really far more interested in the things that the Harry Potter fandom was coming up with than I was in anything that was happening in canon. Because concepts like what Landon is talking about were floating around the fandom at this time. Um, of like how certain things could work and how Aquamancy and Legomancy can work and like why was Harry so bad at it? Like I think in the book it appears to me that the reason why we're supposed to think that well actually we're we're gonna get to Aquamancy and Legomancy yeah, later. I'll save that. Okay. I'll save that. Okay. Well, I'll save this thought for <laughs> when we actually talk about it. It's all interconnected, which means it's all very interconnected. Hard to talk about. <laughs> yes. Um. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, the concept of possession. Um, it really has a lot more to do with soul to soul connections, which we don't see enough of. So yeah, okay. Well, let's next talk about um, Verita Verita Serum. Uh, I know that's that's what's next. Yes. So Verita okay. Serum. Um, and so again, this is talking about the privacy of the mind and how it works within the Harry Potter world. And we are introduced with in the very first book. Uh, in the very first book, Severus Snape, in his long speech to to the first years learning about potions, he talks about truth-telling potions. But we don't actually get it until the fourth book, where we are introduced with it with Barty Crouch Jr., who was disguised, descri- disguised as Mad-Eye Moody, confessing after he's been forced to drink it. Yep. Confessing to the rise of Voldemort being back. Uh it then plays a bigger part in the fifth book where it is being used as a tool for investigation and intimidation. Mm-hmm. And it basically, the way that the potion works is that any person, no matter how strong-willed or clever they are, after three drops of this potion is unable to hide anything but the tr- but say the truth. So they can't even not say anything they have to say it 
if they are asked a question. Mm -hmm. So Um, this, this truth potion, truth potion always brings up a bunch of fun questions that of course, Harry Potter does not address. (laughs) Any of, of course them. not. Why but, would they do that? But I love these. Con- I love these concepts, and these are like this is like Karen's wish list of stuff that I wish we would have gotten in relation to Verita Serum. Because if you're going to have a truth telling potion, then you have to decide what does truth mean in your universe. Does it mean? Oh, bless you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, does it mean the objective truth, or does it mean your truth? Because we know in our world that like if you're on the stand and you're giving like a witness testimony, there is a lot of problems with that because you can have a lot of uh, witnesses to a particular, you know, crime or incident or whatever and get different stories and none of them be lying. Okay. And I, I feel like any kind of any kind of truth potion really just boils down to like a very similar thing as to like a, a polygraph test in our world, which we already know it's BS. Like polygraph tests are not real, by the way. So if you ever are watching Maury and it's like, a, you know, according to the polygraph test, you're lying. Like it doesn't prove, that, it doesn't prove that you're lying. It just proves that you're nervous. <laughs> and I feel like um, truth potions must in fact, function the same way because the way that our brain encodes memories and encodes information is not taking an objective truth. It's, it it, it simply can't like, I mean, human brains are amazing, but like, they're not computers. They cannot uh, record objective truth in that way. So, um, but we never, we never get this in Harry Potter. And I have to assume that's because the way that Verita serum works is that you're supposed to tell your truth. Um, but I just feel like it's, it's out of all the things that, uh, that JK Rowling takes the, the time to really go into a lot of detail and explain like how it works and the mechanics of it. Verita Serum and Possession, I think to a lesser extent also, these are two things that like get thrown in and then just never explained how they really work. Again, another hollow book. Yeah. Like, I'm going to keep using that metaphor because I'm really fucking proud of it. But also, that's because it is. It is this thing that has been thrown out and we is actively used. So it's not like some unspoken language and that she has to Tolkien to build the world, right? It is actually used and yet never defined. Um, never and never explained. Like, okay, do does the ministry use this? Uh, could this have, like, freed Sirius Black? Why did Sirius Black never use this? Like, what is the definition of truth and why is this allowed when something like the imperious curse which also takes away the consent of being able to do something is not mm-hmm. like that's banned for life in azkaban by the ministry yet Veritas serum is being actively used by a ministry official now don't get me wrong i love the metaphor there of a corrupt ministry that allows tactics that uh, is an effect to their benefit and bans the things that are not however i have a feeling that is not the metaphor that she was going for (laughs) Uh, (laughs) it's a coincidence they say a coincidence Mm -hmm. it certainly feels like a coincidence you know what i mean it certainly feels like a Um, coincidence yeah and again with karen this is this is when the fandom was so alive and bright and thoughtful with their explanations because then yes as a fandom we kind of decided how veritas serum works we kind of decided oh it only works for this short length of period oh it does this oh it does that oh you know they have to burst out they have to tell their version of the truth rather than the facts like and and that's not necessarily canon that's not canon no this is all fandom uh and that it's not taken and in the world of in canon it's not taken as fact it is taken like a polymorph a uh, polygraph or some sort of like oh you're telling your version of the truth and now we have to gather everyone's version of the truth in order to um in order to actually gather what happened and then from there we decide so yeah sort like of if thing. If Verita Serum is something that is that is so simple um, to make that um, that this High Inquisitor character Dolores Umbridge can ask the potions master of a school to whip her up a batch, um, then why is it not like a standard part of um, of witness testimonies in high profile 
cases, just like for the longest time when we were believing polygraph tests, it was kind of a standard part of high profile, high profile cases. Now that there's a lot of studies about it that say like, it's really not true. Um, it's not, that's not so much the case anymore, but there were many, many years where that was the case. So why is it not in the Harry Potter world? Hollow book, that's why. Yep, that is why. <laughs> um, and also just, I think because there is a, there is a cool thing that we can throw in and it solves the problem and it puts a bandaid on a problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't need any more thinking than that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it would have been cool to actually feel like there was more thought with that. Yeah, it would have been. So anyway, everybody, uh, again, once again, everybody that said, praises the world building in Harry Potter, you're not praising the world building. You're praising the loca the lo description locations. The, yeah, description That's what's locations. really, really good. Uh, and, and, and you know what? I will also give her credit of the creativity that comes with the different uh, physical places within her book. Yeah. Like, I think that her, not only the way she describes them, but the way that she builds her actual physical world is fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and integrates it within the world. Everything other than that sucks. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want to go to there, you know? I, it gives I me that want, feeling. I really appreciate how she describes the ministry and how the concept of the ministry plays into the world and really speaks to the vibe of it all. Yeah. Um, and and how that ministry is so like new with with its architecture compared to Harry to, to Hogwarts, which is so old and ancient. And like that cool, like, idea of that even battling but that doesn't but then she's like is just like here's the thing <laughs> that's truth what it feels potion. like <laughs> here's the yep. thing that literally in latin is truth potion uh anyway yep uh, all right uh, aquamancy and legilimency 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 i just like, can't legit, do these words legilimency legilimency and occlumency okay oh my god i don't know why i have such trouble with that word the g like There's throws no, me off or something I, do you believe there's no hard G's in Latin, if that helps? Oh, so so, so every, it would be legilimency. Soft G. Okay. All right. Got it. All right. So, alchemancy and legilimency. Um, as Landon was talking about, there is a wonderful fandom theory that the reason Harry is so bad at these lessons he's getting from Snape really has a lot more to do with the fact that the way him and Voldemort are connecting is on a soul level and alchemancy and legilimency are operating on a mind level. But that is a pure fandom invention. Yeah. In the books, if you just read the books and you don't really think too much about it, the reason Harry is bad at these lessons is because Severus Snape is a bad teacher and he's mean to him and Harry just is constantly trying to one up him because he doesn't like him. And it has a lot more to do with their, their student teacher relationship than it does with the actual magic going on. Um, Cause like, like Landon said, there's a point where Harry pushes too far and that's how he gets kicked out of class. I also, I want to clarify that, that also in the books, Harry is written to just be bad at it. Like it's not even, cause he's bad at it with Hermione. Like that's clearing true. his mind and being able to do things like it is an active thing that not only is Snape terrible and abusive to him when teaching him uh, and he's abusive or and he's terrible back, I should say, um, but he's also just written to be bad at it, which makes no sense to previous things. Anyway, we'll get into that. No, let's do that. Like, why? Okay. Why do you think? Well, why do you think he has to? He's he's has to be bad at it. And why should would it instead be a better choice for him to be good at this task? Oh, I will. I don't even. So da, 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 da. the right choice would to make would be to make this a soul connection, right? Uh, I don't even think that there is another that I can even brainstorm. There isn't a world in which Harry is good at this and also then tricked at the end of the book, right? So Harry has to be bad at this in order to get the basic very plot. So if like when a, when a person typically writes, they write out the very skeleton of a plot. And so in order to make X, Y, Z happen, he has to be bad at G, F, H. Mm -hmm. um, so he has to be bad at it in order for it to successfully work, uh, to, for the plot to work. 
it doesn't make any sense given the fact that he has the mental strength, which is using the same skills and can naturally throw off the imperious curse. Yes. From the previous book. He has no problem being able to rebel and defy and hold out on something that uses, as far as we are told as readers, the same mechanics of being able to stay calm and keep yourself and your mind safe. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, Snape was not the, also the, was the wrong choice. Like, like JKR set the seat up great in order for me like yeah harry also sucks at it and also snape is a terrible teacher for him yep because so snape a, never could have helped him get good at it never Snape is a terrible teacher b has a vendetta and harry is a extremely traumatized child who is then being forced to relive his trauma by someone who caused his trauma and then mocks his trauma <laughs> Like, no one is going to be successful in that, realistically. And and I think that that was the purpose of, of what JKR was setting up. Because Harry needs to not be successful in order for the book to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would have been better if it just didn't fucking matter at all because it was a different reason. And it was that soul connection that was allowing them to see each other. Yeah. That, that, because it makes more sense. Like you need, like even Snape talks about it. You need eye contact for the most part for legitimacy. There's a spell involved. So how the fuck is Voldemort doing it from halfway across the world or halfway across Britain at the very least. um, (laughs) And doing it halfway across Britain without any sort of thing and it's only happening when harry's asleep yeah because he's not using any of these skills he's using the soul connection he has with harry and the thing is is like so here's the other part that kind of bothers me with this right so they set it up for snape to do these lessons right but why knowing how the mechanics of occlumency and legilimency work i finally i'm finally getting the word right now um knowing the mechanics of how these work why would Dumbledore think that this would help doesn't he on some level know that this connection between Harry and Voldemort is a soul connection and not a mind connection canonically canonically uh it is not confirmed that that Dumbledore thinks it's horcruxes until after this book till the summer between um the fifth and sixth year According to Dumbledore in the next book, he did not know or think it was that a, a Horcrux until then. Um, however, again, plot hole, because he's also asking Snape to protect Harry throughout all of this. Right. Uh, in order to lead him to slaughter. Yeah. Uh, because we're already being set up and we already get the feeling that Dumbledore, if you deep dive into his character, is setting up Harry for that slaughter yeah um and maybe at this point in time it's in order to be a fighter a loyal fighter to him um and and not a giant chess piece that he ends up being but like i don't know so there is an excuse there but also at the same time yeah i i like to take the fan in approach and be like dumbledore knew Harry, he has a connection to Voldemort to know what Voldemort is doing at all times. Why the fuck would he stop that? Why the fuck would he want to stop that? Yeah, I think that's, that's much more interesting. Incredibly powerful too. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's way more interesting. I am definitely more on board with that. And it's just one of those things that's like when it comes to Harry Potter, like we're pointing out plot holes, and and we don't mean to do it as like a cinema sins ding 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 type of thing. The only reason we we focus on some of these plot holes in Harry Potter and we don't talk about plot holes in a lot of our other media episodes really has to do with the fact that J.K. Rowling pretended and still pretends that she had everything planned out and knew everything that was going on. And so it's just like, no, she obviously didn't because there's these plot holes that when you think about them for a second, they're kind of annoying. Well, and also she has been completely... (sighs) Harry Potter is unique. In its, in its effect of fandom and the way that uh, fans take ownership over what is existing in this world. Yeah. Like it is an incredibly unique 
experience um, to anything else that we've, that we have dived into. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's because JKR and the fandom have such oppositional views on what she's written. Well, I think also also it's, there's almost kind of this um, secret formula to making something really popular with a big fandom. You first, you have to get something that that taps into some kind of zeitgeist that's going on, and I think yeah. that um, that the idea of being able to go to a magical school is is part of that. But Harry Potter wasn't the only magical school book being written around this time. There were others in that area too. Portal fantasies are are a thing, right? But you also have to like not be. This is going to sound so bad, but you can't be too good, because if they're, you're too good, then there's nothing for the fandom to build on and fight about yeah so you have to be like just good enough to capture imagination but not so good because then you don't generate the uh you don't generate the talking points that build the fandom you also can't be defensive about it which is the thing that she breaks more than anything um because she is then pretending that she a had it planned out and b has it all right and the reality is is that as soon as you've published it and you've allowed someone else to read it it no longer belongs to you and that's something that she hasn't learned yet no but the thing is is at the time that this was happening you felt like she understood that because she was very supportive of fan works and she really didn't spend a lot of time arguing with fans about the fact that their theories were wrong or anything of that nature it was all just like it was all just very subtle things like neville knocking over all the time turners that was like the way that she stabbed at people that um that said things she didn't like now she just gets on twitter and actually just says her views but the thing is is like if she had never done that if she had never done that kind of like post-mortem you know pottermore website things like that then we wouldn't really think of her as somebody that was like that we wouldn't. We would just think of her as somebody that was like, wow, she was so supportive. She she never went after fanfic offers or anything like that. You know, it was great. Um, but because once she was done with the book, she couldn't leave well enough alone and move on to something else. Now she has this reputation. Yep. And also, she wasn't making that big of a deal of it because she still had control of it. Mm-hmm. She was still writing the books. Finished, and as soon as it finished, she no longer had control. Yep. And when people took her final, her final thing that she put out in the world that she wrapped neatly in a bow and was like, everyone will understand exactly what I'm saying. And she put it out there and people questioned the man that she called a hero, that they questioned the deeper themes of some of the things that she had been writing about as the fandom grew older as they looked more into it as it became without a lack of a better like comparison a religion in some aspects being questioned uh that she took it personally there's this like there you know it's like the domino meme of like the in the little domino is everyone hated the harry potter epilogue and then the big (laughs) domino is um jk rowling becomes an outspoken twitter turf (laughs) yes yes that is exactly what happened <laughs> so that's why we're we critique it in the way that we do um yeah. but i think it's it's an important thing and and the occlumency and legitimacy as a concept incredibly incredibly interesting concept mm-hmm. um that there is magic of the mind that there that powerful people can can slip in and mind read for for even though that Snape has hates that um it it works very in tandem with the idea of pensive magic right so we've seen or pensive magic we've seen this magic similar before of being able to dive into memories uh and that is what is happening with occlumency and legitimacy so it's not necessarily reading minds but but memory magic Mm -hmm. um which again we see later when we talk about the the miss the room of uh not room of requirement the department of mysteries mm-hmm. we see a little bit of of memory magic but we don't really actually dig into it too much yep and i would say that our next topic is actually in some ways memory magic too so the other yeah. kind of like thing that oh but before that actually we got, a, <laughs> we got something first though i forgot this was here <laughs> Um, all right. Hey, listeners. Do you want a book about mind control? Or Your kitty cat does. Control? I know. It's a really good book. 
<laughs> um, I have a book for you. I don't have a cover for it, so I'm not going to pull it out of my library. But I have a book for you. Um, and it's kind of has to do with mind control, but it kind of has to do with the ethics of connection and memory and everything like that. And we are, since we're digging into JKR, we're going to bring up another incredibly popular uh, YA novelist during that time, and that's Stephanie Meyer. But fuck Twilight, guys. Fuck Twilight. I'm talking about The Host by Stephanie Meyer. Now, if anyone hasn't read this book, you should. The Host is about the idea of aliens from another place coming down and infecting humans with their consciousness to exist inside of their bodies but our main protagonist who is one of these cybo slugs for lack of a better word um cerebo slugs uh they uh enter the mind and they have a relationship or a connection with the memories and the mind that used to occupy that body and that makes them question their morals as uh people who are taking over the world and it's a really interesting thought process and book so uh why don't you listen to it on audible who is the sponsor of today's episode and has and we have a link for you so it's www.audible.com or trial.com slash enter stage window uh you should join get those perks read a book yep if you do the 30 day free trial through our link then um we get a little commission from that so you're helping support the show yeah. if you are interested in uh signing up for audible please do it through our link please and don't let anti stephanie meyer rhetoric fool you this book is decent the movie trash but this book decent i never read the book <laughs> but i watched the movie and i was like what in the heck the this movie, is like this is like is bad love triangle job. animorphs. <laughs> yeah, no, the 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 it did a terrible job of understanding the actual deeper concepts here. Uh, there is a love triangle. Uh, one of the people there's actually a lot of love like poly quad uh, but um, one of the love triangles, two of them share a body, so it's really fascinating. <laughs> Truly truly about mind control yes anyway shall we move on <laughs> yes all right prophecy. prophecy so so the way that prophecy works in harry potter is this sort of like hand of god comes down and just like and like puts and puts its like little you know those like head massager feelies on the head of certain wiz witches and wizards and um and then they open their mouths and the prophecy just kind of like streams out like a water beam from a Pokemon. And, and it creates this, this globe of gas that can now speak the prophecy at any time. And this is how prophecy works in Harry Potter, basically. <laughs> yes. So. <laughs> yes. And then, but then it's still vague and still confusing and yet also specific enough that uh it can be labeled in a department of mysteries with people's names and only those people are allowed to touch it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and know about the prophecy yep so only harry and voldemort can touch the prophecy that we learn trelawney gave for the entire impetus of this book so yep. What we come to find out is that even though Trelawney is not that great at divination as a whole, one time she did do a for real legit prophecy. Well, twice, because we saw it in Prisoner of Azkaban too. Yes, true. Twice. So we saw it in Prisoner of Azkaban and then the entire impetus for this book, the prophecy that caused Voldemort to go and attack Harry came from Trelawney. So like... She is the legit real thing, even if she doesn't have like the wide like breadth of um of of skills as a divinator. Uh, so she is basically a Cassandra character. That is that is her role. She has the gift, and she is destined to have nobody believe her. Which is funny because her great grandmother, who or her grandmother who inherited the gift, was named. Cassandra so you'd assume that that would have been the Cassandra character mm -hmm. uh but no <laughs> turns out <laughs> anyway and when it comes to prophecies we get a lot about the prophecies surrounding the specific events of the the book but there isn't much greater world building in regards to prophecies so you really don't get any sort of sense 
in the way that the wizarding world feels or acts around prophecies. The only thing that we know, really, for world building sense when it comes to prophecies, is that when this this prophecy gas snow globe is created, it go you're supposed to take it to the Ministry of Magic and and they have it in this special locked room where no one can see it and and only ever the people that it's about can come and get those prophecies. So so we have some sense that prophecies that are dangerous. Informed. Yeah, and yeah. Also never informed because you just have to go and ask. Voldemort <laughs> wasn't informed, and we no. know that Harry wasn't informed. So so you just kind of have to like go to the Ministry and be like. Hey, are there any prophecies about me? And like, I guess just check on it every couple years or something. It's unclear. And we The other thing we know about world building is that it is important enough and believed enough that Voldemort got incredibly paranoid and changed his tactics in order to start hunting down Harry. Yeah. Um, and so like it is, it is, prophecy is obviously very important and, and, and believable within Mm -hmm. within the wizarding world too. Yeah. And it's dangerous. Like if prophecies weren't dangerous, the ministry wouldn't have an entire room with shelves upon shelves upon shelves of all the prophecies ever. Um, which implies (laughs) that somehow the ministry knows anytime a prophecy happens and sends their goons out to go get the prophecies, right? Because otherwise, how would they have them all? Wouldn't individual divinators like have their own prophecies on hand and like hide them from the ministry? Like that's probably a thing that happens in the Harry Potter world. Um, But um, but JK Rowling only loves the status quo, so she probably never even thought of that. So... (laughs) And it wasn't relevant to the book. So again, I I understand not needing to tokenize it, but when you put all of these things together, it's like, okay, there's a lot of stuff here that was kind of just thrown at the wall to see what sticks. Yeah, it's a lot lot of setup and no payoff. Like any one of these, in any one of these things we've been talking about in relation to like the way that the privacy of the mind and the way that truth uh, Mm -hmm. happens in Harry Potter Any one of these you could argue for, like, it doesn't really matter. But when you put them all together, it's kind of like, wow, there's a lot here that was unexplored. Also, like, we never hear about it again. Yeah. Right? Like, from this point on, it's this huge, huge important moment. And, of course, we hear of the prophecy again. But the idea of prophecy, other than the prophecy falls completely off the page. Like if there had been, I loved, you know, it was great setting up prophecy and Trelawney as a real po- prophet who no one believed in the third one to then have her come back and be the person who who did the prophecy about Harry. But mm-hmm. why is a prophecy never mentioned again? Why why does nothing ever happen again? It Like it's a three-point setup right there. Things come in threes. They sh- there should yeah. have been another time where it was at least semi-important to round it out after the fifth to bring Mm -hmm. it in together so it didn't just feel like oh here's this plot thing that we're gonna just throw into this one book and give you all the information and you'll never have to worry about it again wouldn't it have been really cool if like we did the the editing doctor that i was talking about where harry starts to have some of these thoughts about like changing the world and maybe things don't have to be how they are and and you know what if i ruled the world type of thoughts in relation to forenzi and his divination formula and then forenzi was able to give him a prophecy about what happens to him at the end of the books wouldn't that I have been so cool i actually no i don't want it in the fifth book because I. Think but in the that- next book In the next book, that would have been fine. I think that that is the problem that I'm having, that so much of this book is, here is a bunch of information that you will never use again. JKR has done a great job hinting at possible things throughout the entirety of her series. And maybe it doesn't, like, maybe it's not things that are, like, hinted at in book one that happened in book seven, but it is things that are, like, set up in book three and actually matter in book four, or things that are set up in book six that are actually matter in book seven, right? None of that happens for this book. Everything that is important in this book is set up in this book. And it's very unsatisfying and disconnected from the rest of the series because of it. 
And it would have been fine if some of these setups were paid off in the next books, but so few of them are. Like if Harry had had some of those thoughts that I'm talking about and he actually had a conversation with Frenzy, we'd have this connection here and he could come back like either in the sixth book or at the beginning of the seventh book and have a new prophecy for Harry that would help him in regards to the Horcruxes or something like that, right? Trelawney, Trelawney also comes back. She comes back in the sixth and seventh book. So even having her do it again, so it's that same consistency of, three right so it's she's done all three or or how that would work too also the fact that occlumency and legitimacy is never mentioned again other than harry thinking about how he should be doing it in the seventh one but it's never like brought up again so it is literally this important thing for about 150 pages and Mm -hmm. then doesn't matter then it goes away it's like that's so much of this book Mm -hmm. And it's like, it turns out that none of this mattered and Harry really didn't need Aquamancy or Legelimancy le- lessons. It was pointless. It was just it was just a device for us to find out that Severus Snape is a mean person and a bad teacher because he was bullied by Harry's father as a child. That's why Aquamancy and Legelimancy, or yeah, I'm, I'm still not saying it right, whatever. You, you got it, you got it. Okay, <laughs> why legitimacy exists in this book. Like literally, if you look at the, in its entirety and prophecy is the same way. Like prophecy exists so that we can decide why Harry is the main character instead of like Harry's personality being why he was chosen for the main character. Yeah. Hell, also very to serum. It never matters again after this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like the only thing that comes back is Umber. <laughs> oh, poor right. umbridge poor umbridge oh, terrible terrible person yeah poor traumatized umbridge uh all right True. shall we go to the next part yes okay department of mysteries y'all this, is, this might be a bit of a love fest this particular session if you've been like <laughs> sitting there and being like wow Linda and karen hated everything the answer is we hated 75 percent the other 25 percent was luna love good festivals and the department of the street yeah so we're gonna end on some like positive stuff so we're gonna kind of bookend it a little bit um i have what? to imagine because i I see our viewer count i have to imagine that's why the chat's been quiet because we've been, been complaining a lot so if you've been yeah. if you've been tuning out because of that here we go we're gonna talk about some cool stuff the department of mysteries what a neat location in both the books and the movies i freaking love it again with her physical explanations and locations and being able to have them be important and the subtlety of tying things together Mm -hmm. this is amazing like like even the entrance way of you step into a a room of doors and it spins and so you have to like it's like this it's like a representation of all of the choices are laid before you just go forth and search Mm -hmm. right like that's so fucking cool yeah and it's very like alice in wonderland trippy like you don't really quite know what's going on once you go into the department of mysteries it's almost like you're in this this world of pure magic where the magic no longer has the rules that it has at school or the rules that it has in the rest of the ministry and it's no longer like hidden like you're you're in the scary stuff the reason why we can't tell muggles we exist right like that's what it feels like and it is so cool this in a way uh is a reflection lightly is a reflection of the maze or not the maze the um for the the trials in the first book mm-hmm. the different rooms of that of going and finding the ultimate goal right this this hidden thing ultimately this is very reflective of that and very grown up of that and there's something incredibly satisfying that even though there's no real connection within the novels like knowing and being able to compare those two of like oh it's the final act of the it's the final act of the book that they're going through these different rooms with these different challenges that they have to face and there's a high tension but it's adult like it's more young adult rather than child's literature and it's it's a really satisfying part of this whole thing mhm mhm yes it's very satisfying i love the department of mysteries i feel like um the fact that the department of mysteries was like so cool to read about is a huge thing that inspired 
um, Landon whenever we were having our Marauders role play to create uh, the character of Luna Lovegood's mother. And Luna Lovegood's mother nice. worked in the Department of Mysteries. And um, and so she was an unspeakable. And we spent a lot of time exploring like what that meant, things that unspeakables could do, things that um, that uh, that could kind of like flesh that out because the way that it's written is just so cool. Like I want more unspeakables in canon. You know, I want to know more about them. Yeah, it's it's some of my favorite tropes in fan fiction to read too. What canon has done with the Department of Mysteries, and just like the different things that are being researched, the different the different aspects, we got a glimpse inside the world building and those hollow books in a way that I wasn't angry about, right? Yeah. Like even even the time turners, I wasn't angry about that room. I was like, oh, that's really cool. The idea that they're studying time and these time turners and this existence of this thing within this room, that seems to fit the idea of the Department of Mysteries. That there's memory magic with brains in a, in a container and that they're trying to figure out all of that stuff too. Like that's really cool research that there's love locked behind a door that is burning hot and there's a whole room dedicated to death and what is happening afterwards it's like they're really they're little plot things that expand the world that we don't need to dig into but make it feel real yeah because they also don't hold anything necessary to the plot more than what they are which is just a glimpse yeah Whereas, so they can dangle out there and, and still be yeah. satisfying it's a worm on a hook compared to, hey, this is actually an important plot thing that we are going to drop and then never get back to. Like prophecy is important, but we're never going to explain it or how it works. Or occlumency and legitimacy is important, but we're never really going to explain it. It's just going to kind of happen. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like this is like, oh, there's a veil of death in there and, and they're really exploring what is happening on the other side of that. And there's an idea of memory and love in here and all these core things that are, that are consistent to the human, to human idea of existence. And that's really what they're studying. They're studying what it's like to be human with magic. Yeah. And I just love that because maybe it's because it's not taking place at Hogwarts, like where I expect yeah. more out of possession and Verita serum and um, occlumency and legilimency and prophecy. And I think the reason why when I see those things, the plot holes are kind of like, you know, all set up and no payoff is because they're at Hogwarts. So they feel like set up to me. They feel like, oh, this is going to come back later. This is important for later. I'm suffering through this book where Harry is incredibly passive because some of these concepts are going to be really important in book six and book seven. But then they are. Then we're given this whole new concept of Horcruxes, which was never introduced before instead of using the con the cool things we already had set up. But when it comes to the Department of Mysteries, that's not the case because we're not at Hogwarts anymore. We're not at Hogwarts anymore. We are, our characters have put a toe into the adult world. And so I don't expect them to come back to these concepts. I expect these to be concepts that are here just for us in the fandom to play with in our Harry as an adult alternate universe, you yes. know, instead of them coming back well, as something that's a payoff later. And also it, it lived up to the height and expect hype and expectations, right? Mm -hmm. We've spent most of this book of Harry dreaming of this door uh, to the point that he even has a vision of Arthur Weasley guarding this door. And he's a snake who attacks Arthur Weasley. Like we see this door and we know that this place is important. And then it lives up to the height in my hype, in my opinion, the prophecy not so much but the place itself yes absolutely it's like oh this is insane and so cool and honestly like it's really cool for me in both um in both the books and the movies and the 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 time that it finally becomes kind of uncool is in the books when the death eaters come in and they start the fight and then i have to read the phrase baby headed death eater 60 fucking times um but we did a whole episode on why the death eaters aren't scary so you can go find that on my youtube channel if you're interested um but up until that point like i am here for it i'm like this is the coolest thing i've ever read oh my god yeah, i can't believe it it's like or the tension of Ron getting trapped by the brains. Yes. And then like the octopus brains, which is still wild. Like if you if you wrote a category and it was like 
brains with octopus tentacles and baby headed death eater like both are fucking quite crazy and wild um but there was a tension with the brains and fighting these off and now and now ron having scars for the rest of his life because of how much these memories and brains clutched him in like that's such a cool concept and metaphor there um and it's a really interesting idea that it's 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 so cool or like death calling out from behind the veil of calling to those the same the people who can see thestrals Mm -hmm. right the same of those who can actually see and have interacted and have been personally beheld by death which is a really cool concept to then compare and a missed opportunity i believe to then tie in the idea of death itself during the seven book Mm -hmm. because like like, i would would love love to see what like would have done with that, that connection because we need death as a character. Mm-hmm. So and what, and the thing is, that connection? Connection. and inside this book, the connection is really cool. Like I actually really appreciate that. Um, you know, this is the book where Sirius dies, right? He falls into the veil and, and he dies and he doesn't come back. And I actually really appreciate the moment of world building connection where Harry set it goes to the ghosts and is like, but he could come back, right? And yeah. what we learn is that in some ways when you're a wizard and you have magic death is almost a choice like it is the result of not only the uh, actual thing that causes you to die itself but also your willingness and interest in dying um because if you have certain types of deaths where you are unwilling instead you become a ghost right There are uh, characters that even if they don't become a ghost, an echo of them lives on in certain portraits, right? But uh, but that's not true for Sirius because Sirius was the black sheep of his family. So there are no like sentient-ish portraits of Sirius. There's only old like photos, which basically amount to like GIFs, I guess. They're kind of like animated GIFs. Like that's the only thing we have for Sirius. He, he He does not choose to stay in this world in any capacity and so there he doesn't become a ghost and um and i think that is really an interesting idea and i would love to see it further explored in later books because we get this other cool concept of death in the later books where um where you know a a voldemort he divides his soul right for the horcruxes and um and and then he dies again because of that essentially and um and and wizards don't really die as young as Voldemort dies. A lot of times they live much 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 longer. <laughs> so Voldemort has uh, does specific actions to cause himself to die sooner. And um, and I just feel like there's like a lot of interesting things that we're saying yeah. about death in these books. And it's one of the areas that I actually do feel like is really well explored. And so many yeah. interesting ideas that connect to each other. Absolutely. And and but again, it's like. This is an incredibly well done piece that exists within this book. Mm-hmm. None of it connects later, even though it should. Uh, until fan fiction, in fan yeah. fiction, it does, and I'm very grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, it is an incredibly well built thing. I, you know what? I even don't mind the chase afterwards through the ministry through the mystery of uh, the department of mysteries uh after the after the whole showdown in the hall of prophecies with the death eaters i don't mind it because i think it goes to show like again how dangerous these things are and it still helps build the world a little bit um the baby headed death eater thing was a little wild but you know what it just makes it unscary for me it makes it unscary i would have been a better choice for them to say i know it looks like a baby but it's still a fucking death eater zap zap die okay so for me it the the mood changed and i didn't mind the mood change it went from thriller creepy stealth to we are in active combat Mm. destroy everything we can in order to do things and so this is the kind of chaos that comes with combat Mm -hmm. there's a difference between stealth and combat and and this and like that that tone shift was okay with me Mm -hmm. um but it it is it's just really interesting but then again 
it doesn't do us any favors of them being fearful of the death eaters yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no i think it's i think it's fantastic it's a great concept i i wish we had seen all 12 doors i think that that would have been really cool or at least know what all 12 doors were um and that's something that i personally am like what are the other doors we only know seven um <laughs> so i uh yeah that's but department of mysteries was awesome it was amazing Mm-hmm. it's it's Love that part it's probably one of my favorite locations in all of the series yeah i would i would agree with that it's fantastic hogwarts, i love the magic of hogwarts and her description of hogwarts in the first few books um but department of mastery is is right up there with that yeah yeah whereas like hogwarts hogwarts makes you feel like you want to go there department of mysteries makes me feel like i want to go there in the same way you know yeah. and you know what i don't actually the other one is um seventh book ministry of magic after it's been turned mm-hmm. um her description and tone in the way that she describes that is also yeah, that's masterful. really good too really good. um to, and, and kind of you need the comparison of what it was in this book in order to really understand it but it, it's awesome yep so that is that is what i got love the department of mysteries anything else so okay so we are actually at the end of all of the things i think we wanted to talk about today so we are on finally now that we're at part two we're actually gonna ask did it resonate so landon does order of the phoenix resonate with you and did it originally when you read it as a kid i feel like these are two very different questions when it comes to this book so what do you think as a kid it resonated uh, in a way that was very different than it resonated for my friends. Um, as a kid, I understood Harry's anger and never had a problem with it. Um, I did have a problem with like the lack of consistency of it. Like there would be times where I'm like, why is he like this? And then suddenly like this. Um, but that actual feeling, a lot of my friends were like, I hate the fifth one because Harry's so angry in it. I loved that. I felt connected to the true character. Um, And as an adult, that still being something that I look for in my protagonist, something that I I look for in the novels that I read is how genuine, like I'm emotions for first person. So I'm like, how genuine are the feelings of this character and how realistic to what this character is supposed to be created to do is it? And unfortunately, it no longer resonates for that purpose. Harry's anger isn't realistic enough for me. Uh, mm-hmm. The stages of grief aren't there enough for me. Uh, it, it feels hollow and enough of it, like, again, that, like, idea of uh, he, he, it feels hollow and hollow can be purposeful. This is not purposeful. Uh, it is. It is in my belief that we show... JKR having no idea the emotional connections of her characters and because this was such a rush job on a book the editors didn't push for more yeah unlike in the fourth and third book where we see them start pushing for more and I think that that's also what makes this so incredibly disappointing as well is because we've seen that growth in the series and all of a sudden it's three steps backwards we're back to like book one emotional Harry uh, as far as like the the trueness of of what the writer feels and is connected and is connecting for the reader. Yeah, I would agree with most of that. Um, sorry, the dog was being really weird outside. I went to let her in the first time and then she walked away from me. She's like, she came I actually back. don't want to be in here. But, <laughs> but then do. she, but I now she's in here. Me. All right. So, so for me, I mean, did it resonate at the time? It was definitely the first Harry Potter book that I read where I was like, this isn't as good as the other ones. And at the time, I was definitely on in the camp of like, it's because Harry's so angry. But that's not true. Like, that's not true. And I don't think that's what I was actually complaining about at the time. I just didn't have the um, enough knowledge about how to craft stories or enough knowledge of like how these major political systems that are happening in the background of Harry Potter actually work to be able to articulate why this book started to frustrate me. And I would say, unfortunately, as an adult, it resonates even less 
than it did when I was younger because now I do have that knowledge and I can more articulate why this book frustrates me so much and why I see it as the downturn of the series. There are a lot of people that will tell you nowadays that are around my age and a little bit older, you know, like um, late 30s, early 40s people basically that will tell you like, of course I was into Harry Potter when I was younger, but then I just kind of got out of it. I don't know, I wasn't really huge into it. And I can tell you why. It's because once you start to um, get out of the age of these books, which because of the long summer, that happened during this book for a lot of people, um, the plot holes as far as like the, um, the way that Harry and his friends navigate through the world start to bother you in a way that they're not going to bother a kid. And I don't mean in like the CinemaSins ding kind of plot holes. I mean in the overall, like how there's all this setup and no payoff, you know? Um, and so I just think this book, it, 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 it's where I started to fall out of love with canon as a kid and then as an adult, like, no, it absolutely doesn't resonate with me. There are certain passages in this book I like, certain chapters that I like. I love that it introduces Luna. She's my fave. She's awesome. Um, Umbridge is the best villain ever. Like, she's amazing. Uh, it, Department of Mysteries, amazing location. But just overall, there's a lot of setup and no payoff. And and, and it never comes. It's not like It's not like I can just read the sixth and seventh book and get my payoff. It just never happens. See, and I, I disagree with that. So I know that for you, this is the down point. For me, it's not the down point. I genuinely enjoy the sixth and seventh book. They, the sixth book is my favorite book. Um, we'll see. It's been a little while since I've reread it. So we'll see if it, if it holds up like to these deep dives, but it is still my favorite book plot wise. It's my favorite book genuinely under, like, I feel like edited the best. It, there's actual growth in the characters and develop. It starts to feel real. Uh, and there's a change of tone that I appreciate in the sixth book. So for me, this isn't a downward turn. This is like a toll on a highway. Like I'm going 80 miles an hour through the series as I'm reading, I'm going faster and faster and faster. And then all of a sudden I have to stop. I have to get out my money. I have to pay the toll. And then I'm expected to go pick up right where I was. Right? <laughs> like it's, it is a stop. It is a momentary pause and it makes it so annoying. <laughs> now, based uh, on my memory, the sixth, the sixth book is better. We'll see how I feel with all my reread when I get to that. But, but based on my memory, I do think that the sixth book is a little bit better than this one. But then I have issues with the big issues with the seventh book. So it's like, it's kind of like, you know, whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but the six, I love the sixth book, six and three are my favorites, so I'm, I am looking forward to being able to dive into that, um, because I, man, but yeah. No, also, I think, I think like the sixth book, you probably love it so much because your little dreary heart is so filled from that book. <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, I, it's not even a dreary, but it's also a Draco, like I think yeah. that we also see, we see some growth in our side characters that we, yeah. we have not seen yet, Draco definitely being one of them. Um, but I, I definitely think like Harry starts taking on Harry actually, and maybe it's, maybe it's coming off of Harry being so passive that seeing him be more active than we've ever seen him before, when he starts hunting Horcruxes, starts taking in like information as we start learning about the villain that we've been told that we need to be scared of for six books now, mm -hmm. um, as we start really exploring the world, both as who Harry wants to be in this world and who he isn't, I think that there's something there. Uh, there's a lot of growth in characters in, in, in and like also Remini, like, yeah, obviously the love, the love connections are, are a big part of it, a big part of my love for YA, but I'm, I'm excited to read this one, but this one felt like a toll stop and I'm yeah. always angry when I get to it. <laughs> yep. 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 I, I can agree with that. I can I definitely think that agree with hard that. Because we do come off of the book that is the best technically written book. Yep. Um, and then the one before that, I think we both agree the third one is, is by far like our yeah. favorite book. So we go so we, favorite book, best technically written book, worst book in the series. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> literally introduce. Well, no, it's not the worst book in the series. I will fight you on that. But uh, you know what I mean? Like in a technical sense, no, this one is the worst. <laughs> no, I know. But like, uh, man, the second one. Yeah. Still, I skipped the second one. Least on favorite. Everything. Second is still least favorite. But in a <laughs> technical terrible. sense, this one's the worst. But no, it's. It's you start it, you introduce it, you get the engines re revving, you love the third, you love the fourth, the fifth one is a fiery crash trash pit. 
Yeah. Uh, and it's like, man, it is a slog. So, yep. We'll see. We shall see. All, All right. right. Where to find us. And next week. Okay, guys. So next week, we are having our community day. We're going to be playing Stardew Valley. So if you would like to join our farm commune, you can come right back here uh, on this channel and you can play some Stardew Valley with us. Uh, also, for next Thursday's stream, I am continuing my leaf green Nuzlocke. So we will be on part nine of that. Um, as far as my content goes, here is all my socials. I'm putting them in the chat. Um, I post all of my VODs to YouTube, so you can find them there. My most active social media is my Twitter. Um, we have a role play and writing help server, so you can join that. And that also is going to be a more reliable place to get notifications for this stream, because I cannot control whether Twitch sends you a notification or not. But what I can do is control if you have the ping rolls in Discord and make sure those notifications go out. And if you want to just see anything and everything possible, Karen Terry, you can visit my card for um, every link ever. So that is uh, that is where to find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me at Land in Maine on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, this the Twitter content is hit and miss. Uh, this morning I got I got my Wordle in number two, so that was worthy of a post. Um, so that's that's the sort of riveting sort of content you'll find on uh, Twitter. But on Instagram, I'm much more entertaining and funny. Uh, you can find me there, Land in Maine. Yep. And if you want to support Landon directly, please buy her something off of her Amazon wish list. Uh, a lot of the stuff in there goes directly to improving her side of the stream. So, um, so you guys can do that if you would like. Please and thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm just looking for who we want to raid today. Let's see. It looks like Aja is doing Scooby-Doo Mystery Mayhem, which that sounds fantastic. It looks like an old game. It must be it must be like a, a childhood game or something like that. So I think we're gonna raid into Steely Streams. Um nice. before oh, sorry, go ahead. Sounds good to me. All right. Before we do that, though, I would just like to acknowledge also that I know that J.K. Rowling is is back on the the craziness on Twitter and trending. And so I just wanted to remind everybody that she is a billionaire and it actually is OK to be mean to her. And it's not bad optics um, to be mean to J.K. Rowling. So yeah, I just a, wanted to remind a, everybody of that. She's a public figure at any point in time and does not actually actively check her on Twitter because she has someone who does that for her. That's right. But she does go trolling Twitter, looking for people to screenshot and quote tweet and ruin their day, even though her day is not going to be ruined if you do it to her. So that's that about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, I will say, I said at the beginning, I'll say it again. Fuck turfs. Fuck turfs. All right, fuck turfs, solidarity with Ukraine, because that's still going on. Um, yes. Yep, all the things. You guys know how it works. Okay, we're going to raid into Steely now. So uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today. And as always, of course, don't forget to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right, bye, guys. Bye. See you later.